1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is a very familiar text, familiar passage for us as a church family. At least once a year, when we observe the Lord's table together, I will take us to this text. Uh, that's on purpose, because it's worth considering again, and especially I think at the first of the year, at the outset of the year, worthy of our consideration as we approach the Lord's table, and as we approach it another year, and think about what the Lord would want to do in our lives, and in our church. So I want to read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 17, as Paul is writing to this church in Corinth. He has received word from some members of the church about some of the things that have been going on in this church. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of spiritual problem in this church. And Paul is addressing yet another area of concern in chapter 11 and verse 17. He writes, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worst. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies or factions among you, so that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one takes before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, they have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry for one another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. The rest will I set in order when I come. As we consider this text again together, we'll remind us of things that uh, are, are clear to us, I believe. But we need to keep in mind as we read this text. You consider Paul's context first. And we remember that communion for these believers early on was not merely some isolated ritual, but it was part of an actual meal. It was referred to as the love feast, where the believers would come together and share a meal together. And part of this would be the observance of what we know as the Lord's table. So it wasn't they've gathered for a church service and at the end they pass around little cups and little crackers like we do. What we do is not what they did. So understand this is in the context of a meal and especially in the Middle Eastern world, sharing a meal together was always about fellowship, about uniting together. And what we need to see as well, as we'll mention, is that the divisions that Paul is talking about is primarily a division that is social and ethical. 
you got the haves and the have-nots, and they're not working and playing well together in this context of the church. So Paul's concern is, we could say, well, it's, it, it's threefold. Paul's concern first is that the church is not coming together. But as we read the text, he's very clear, they are coming together. The problem is when they come together, they're not coming together. You are uniting, you're, getting, you're physically in the same room together, in the same building together, in the same house, it would have been a house, you're in the same house together, but you're not together. I point this out every time, but it's, it's worth noting that consider the, what it is for someone with a heart like Paul, what it is for someone to, with a pastor's heart to say to a church, when you come together, you are actually worse off than if you weren't getting together. Imagine if I stood up as a pastor and said, you know what, church, we need to stop meeting together on Sunday because we're worse off meeting together than when we don't meet together. Can you imagine that? That's what Paul says about this observance of the Lord's table. The phrase come together, it can mean to assemble and it can also carry the idea of being united. And as we all know, it is possible to do one without the other. It is possible to gather physically together and not be united. And that's the issue that Paul's concerned with here. So this meeting that you hold, and again, I'll, I'll point out again, you know, how important it is it to be connected, actually connected to a church. I love that Paul says you need to understand this. When you come together in the church, or some translations, as the church. There's a way that we demonstrate we are the church when we're gathered together that is different than the way we are the church when we're scattered during the week. There's an intentional connection here. So they assembled, but they weren't united. In fact, their state was made worse because when they got together, that's when the real divisions among them were made apparent. That's when those schisms really showed up powerfully when they would come together for this observance. So Paul's concern first is that this church was not really coming together. His next concern is that their actual testimony is being called into question. There are people that have reported to Paul that these divisions are clearly seen. This isn't secret. It's not just an isolated case. Everybody can see when these people get together, there's division. And that's not a good thing. So Paul says here, there's been reports that this is true, and I, I partly believe it. Is this Paul kind of being sarcastic? I can't believe that would be true. Uh, maybe. Or is Paul simply trying to exercise a little bit of pastoral caution as he speaks here and says, listen, I, I know this may not be the case in every setting. Maybe not everybody's doing this, but there's definitely some truth to the reports that I'm hearing. There's some truth here, and it's concerning. And Paul makes a fascinating statement about these gatherings in this division. He says in verse 19, for there must also be heresies. And that's the word faction. When we, when we use the word heresy, what do you usually think of when you hear the word heresy? You just think of somebody teaching false doctrine, right? They're teaching a false doctrine. That's heresy, right? You can't say that. That's heresy. The word means faction. False doctrine does create faction. Heresy does, heretical teaching does create factions. It does. Paul's not primarily talking about a doctrinal problem here. There's a social problem. It's a fellowship issue. So these divisions, but he says here, when you come together in verse 19, there, there, there must be heresies so that those which are approved may be made manifest among you, and I think the emphasis that Paul had here is pointing out as much as I hate for there to be division, when people get together, there's going to be some division sometimes. Jesus himself said, Woe to those the, the woe to the world because of offenses, reasons to stumble. They're gonna be there. You put sinners in a room together long enough, somebody's gonna do something. It's gonna make a mess. So we understand that. But Jesus also said, woe to those by whom the offense comes. It shouldn't happen. It does, but it shouldn't. 
But Paul is saying, I think here, that God is able to use even those divisions and schisms that show up in a church to actually do his pruning work and demonstrate ultimately who really is seeking to follow him. That's a sobering thought. So his concern here, their church was not coming together. Their testimony is being called into question. As we put all three of these thoughts together, their communion practice was actually destroying community. And that's an awful picture. So the specific situation that Paul is pointing out here is that the wealthier members of the church would be eating all of their own food while those who didn't have food or didn't have enough food, would basically do without. And I've likened this to a situation, uh, you know, I used to work um, at at a factory, second shift, you know, at a factory, and we'd take our lunch break, and we would take lunch together, you know, we'd have that lunch break together, it'd be, you know, tables, and guys would sit at the same table together, but we'd each bring our own food from home, right? So whatever you had is what you had. Now, once in a while, we maybe on a Friday night, somebody would make a call. We'd all order in, you know, order out pizza or something and share together. But usually what you had is what you brought. So kind of a similar picture, perhaps. Remembering, too, that they didn't have one big church building where all the church was able to gather in one big building in a fellowship hall. It would be in a home, and probably the home of a wealthy patron uh, with, with a large enough space to be able to host. So one ancient writer said this, Pliny the Younger describes in detail the categorization of the qualities of food and drink as marks of favor to grades of guests. Now think about this. He writes, The best dishes were set in front of the host and a select few. And cheap scraps of food would be set before the rest of the company. And he's not writing about a communion meal. He's just writing about the way that Roman society would function when these hosts would host a big meal in their house. This is, the way peop- this is just the way people did it. This was the culture. This was how things were in society of the time. So, he would set... The best food in front of himself and a select few and cheap scraps of food before the rest of the company. He even had the wine put into very small flasks and divided into three categories. One for himself and us. Another for his lesser friends. All of his friends were graded. And the third for his and our freed persons. So that lower class. So three different distinctions of of qualities of, of drink for the various groups. The very use was done, he writes, for manipulative purposes of the varying status indicated by food and drink and the possible locations of diners, so where you would put them in the building. In this room, you might have a a room primarily for dining that could hold maybe a dozen to 20 people in the largest homes, and then you'd have the outlying areas of the house and then the outer courtyard of the house, perhaps. And so you'd have the location of where you were seated would show whether these diners were close friends or second-class friends or hangers-on, head persons, youngsters, servants. All of this speaks about the discriminatory conventions that were presupposed in Greco-Roman society. It's all part and parcel of the symbolic world of an honor-shame culture. This is just how it was done. This was not viewed as outrageous or odd. This is how you did it. And Paul is saying that the issue here is that when you guys as believers get together for a communion meal, probably in one of these wealthier homes, you're doing the same thing that you've always done. You're doing what society recognizes as normal. You've got the class distinctions clearly set up and established. But there's a problem with that. And that's why Paul asks, and he says here, in eating, when in verse 21, for in eating, everyone takes before other his own supper. One is hungry, and another is drunken. So he says in verse 20, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What's the point Paul's making? Whose supper is this? 
Whose meal is this? Is this Jesus' table? Or is it the table of the patron host that's putting the party on? Is it communion or is it just a dinner party? What is this? It's not the Lord's Supper. That's what Paul is saying to these believers. Another writer points out, as we mentioned, Paul doesn't introduce anything new. As we read this passage here, Paul does not introduce to these believers anything new about the Lord's Supper, no new facts or anything, nor does he seek to correct their theology of the meal. He's not saying you're preaching false or untrue things or you're saying untrue things about this meal when you get together. That's not his point. The problem in Corinth was that they failed to embrace and apply the theology of this meal in their relations to one another in the reenactment of this meal. Their actions toward one another demonstrated a profound lack of commitment to the fundamental meaning of the meal, which was Christ's atoning sacrifice for others, for all, regardless of class or caste, social status. So Paul regards such practices, however normal it might have been in respectable Roman culture, regards these practices as an outrage for believers. And again, we need to point out in our day and age that the problem Paul has is not, well, listen, some of you believers are rich and have a lot, and some of you believers don't have a lot, and that's bad. That's not the problem. Those who possess more do have the right to use and enjoy what they possess. That's not the issue. But at a meal that is designed to signify the common standing of all believers in Jesus Christ, that's not the time to start flaunting your wealth. That's not the time to say, okay, the first class people get to sit here, the rest of you sit in coach. That's not what this table is about. So the problem in Corinth is that that this church was not coming together. Their testimony is called into question. And ultimately, the way they are practicing communion is actually undermining their community as believers in Jesus Christ. And that's the problem. So what's the corrective? Not new for us. The corrective from Paul is this. And I'll say it this way for you and for me, as we've said before. The Lord's table cannot be self-serve. The Lord's table cannot be self-serve. Now we'll say that as we pass out individual cups and individual things. You're giving that. Yeah, we understand. But the Lord's table is not about me. It's not about self over someone else. Consider today the Lord's table shows his sacrifice. It can't be self-serve because it shows Jesus sacrifice we remember here his selfless sacrifice Paul says I delivered to you I received the Lord that which I've delivered unto you what is that Paul that the Lord Jesus verse 23 the same night in which he was betrayed took bread the same night in which he was betrayed that word betrayed means literally handed over the night when Jesus was handed over Over On the night when when God handed Jesus over to death for our sake, he took a loaf of bread and gave thanks and break it. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Speaking of Jesus again, who was delivered, handed over. That's the same word, delivered, handed over for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Same thing. Paul says the night that Jesus was betrayed. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, the night that Jesus was handed over to death. Who handed him over? Well, Judas, yeah. But the Father handed him over. Jesus handed himself over. What did Jesus say? No man takes my life. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. I lay my life down freely. This was Jesus' choice. But this is also the choice of the Father to hand him over. 
over to death. Why? Because it was either that or me pay for it myself. So there's where we start. As we approach this table, we're remembering when did Jesus do this? On the night that he was handed over to death for my sin. That's when Jesus did this. And that's what this begins to picture. He established and points toward this new covenant by sacrificing himself. You are able to be brought near to God because of what I am doing. We remember his selfless sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. As we approach this table, we are remembering and acknowledging the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for my sin. And Paul is telling these believers, you have turned this observance into just an opportunity for you to get together and and have a dinner party with your closest friends and just kind of isolate the people that aren't in your social setting, in your social status. That's the wrong picture. As you and I approach this table today, our setting, our social setting, and our context is very different. We may not run into quite the same issues that these believers in Corinth have with our observance. We're gathered here for a service together, and we're going to offer this and observe this together. But you know what? This is supposed to picture the fact that I recognize that Jesus Christ was handed over for my sin, and I've received his grace that I didn't deserve. How does that reality translate into the way we regard and respond to one another as believers in Jesus Christ? Years ago, I got called to a home, a married couple having issues. She's mad at him, he's mad at her, they're mad at each other, she's wrong, he's wrong, you know, whatever. Marriage. Two sinners in the same house. But I got called because, you know, Pastor, there's trouble and and we're having trouble and and you need to come. So I showed up, sat down at the kitchen table, and I'd gotten some good counsel from another pastor just before that. I I wish I'd been smart enough to come up with this on my own, but that's that's what I do. I'll, I'll find people that do it right and just do what they do. But I sat down, and before we said anything else, I asked the wife, I said, would you tell me, actually I started with the husband, I said, would you tell me, what does Jesus mean to you? What did Jesus do for you? See, they both profess faith in Christ. And I got him to tell me about his salvation. And then I asked her, What did Jesus do for you? And I got her to tell me about her salvation. And then we started to talk for a minute about about what Jesus did for us when we were unlovely, when we were unworthy, when we did not deserve anything from him except his judgment, what he did for us to reach out to us and come to us and offer forgiveness to us and absorb the cost of our sin against him in himself. As Paul said, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And you know what? Taking 10, 15 minutes to talk through that completely changed the entire discussion around that table because suddenly this husband was realizing, wait a minute, I've received God's grace and I didn't deserve it and I need to be willing to offer that same grace to this person who sinned against me. And you know what? I didn't just sin against Jesus, I've sinned against her too and I need her forgiveness. And the same thing for the wife to the husband. See, when we understand the gospel, it's kind of hard for us to lord it over someone else when we remember, remember what it costs to make us right with God. When we remember what it cost him to make us right with himself. Himself. 
We remember his sacrifice. We remember not only his selfless sacrifice, but we remember the blessed hope. Paul adds then in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are showing, and that word is to proclaim. You declare the Lord's death until he comes. I love that. Every time we eat and drink this, we are declaring that Jesus died and we're going to do it until he comes back. Okay, we've been in church too long. Sorry, I love that, okay? We're going to declare that Jesus died until he comes back for us. See, that means he's not dead now, you know? But that is our hope. I love the fact that Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica, you're not looking for the Antichrist. Okay, could I caution you? Don't get too wrapped up in the YouTube stuff. All right? Is Antichrist going to show up? He will eventually, absolutely. Okay? But you know what we're looking for as believers? We're looking for Jesus. Paul told the believers in Thessalonica that Jesus himself is going to return. Christ himself is coming for us. We're looking for Jesus. This same Jesus, the angel told those men standing on that hill, this same Jesus will so come again as you've seen him go. This is our hope. And every time we do this, we remember Jesus died for me and he's alive and he's coming back. That's what we're doing. So the Lord's table can't be self-served because the Lord's table shows us his sacrifice. And the Lord's table signifies community. The Lord's table signifies community. Consider what that meant for the believers there in, in Corinth. Paul warns them about sinning against the body of Christ. And I do think he's using kind of a double, there's, there's multiple layer of meaning here. They are sinning against Christ's own body and blood sacrificed for them but their particular sin in this case is committed against those for whom Christ died that is for his body the church their transgression was a failure to recognize the body not just the bread pointing to Jesus physical on the physical body on the cross as one writes but the spiritual body of those who died with him Paul says, here's what Jesus came to do for you, and the way you're coming together is not picturing that. This table is supposed to remind us of what Jesus did for us, and this table is supposed to remind us of what that does for us. It brings us together in Christ. Consider what that meant for them, and, well, more directly, consider what that means for us. Consider what this means for Community Baptist Church. The Lord's Supper must focus our memory on the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So that's what we need to do as a church, and that's what you need to be able to do individually. Is focus and remember, here's what Jesus did. And that's why we'll say again, If you do not know with certainty that you are right now this moment trusting in the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross and that alone for your right standing before God, when these elements come by you, do not take them because they're not for you. A comedian years ago said, I love sitting down and reminiscing with people I don't know. (laughs) How do you reminisce with somebody you don't know? We don't have the same experience. We're not reminiscing about the same thing. If you are not in Christ, when this juice comes by and this bread comes by, you're going to eat this bread, you're going to drink this juice, and you're not remembering what I'm remembering. Because there was a point in time where I was separated from God by my sin, and Christ, in his love, arrested my heart enough to understand I need his forgiveness or I'm not right. And when I drink this, When I eat this bread, when I drink this cup, I am remembering that I have received 
the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ that he reached out to me when I was still a sinner and still unlovely and still worthy of his judgment. He reached out to me to give forgiveness for my sin. And when I eat this bread and I drink this cup, I'm remembering it is his grace that has made me his. And I'm also remembering it is his grace that keeps me his. Did you mess it up this week? Let me rephrase. Were you breathing this week? Okay. If you were, then yeah, you messed it up this week. Anybody have regrets from the last year? Do any of us deserve to approach this table in ourselves? So then why is it out here? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. The Lord's Supper must focus our memory on the death of Jesus Christ, but something else. The Lord's Supper must focus and express our unity as children of God. One writer said this, the Lord's Supper then is not just an observance, but it's a declaration about the way things are to be among God's people. This meal contains a message not only about who Christ is and what he has done for the church, but who is included in the gospel story and in the benefits of Christ's glory. It's a story of belonging and a radical message that God intends for his people to identify with all believers. Whether they're poor or weak or forgotten, this revolutionary social message came into focus as the apostles planted churches and slowly began to untangle the mess of the oppressive class social structure of the Greco-Roman world. Another writer said this, and this is so important, no one changes overnight. Despite the best intentions, or the strongest desires to live differently. Even those of us who know Jesus still wrestle with a nature that fights against loving our neighbor like we love ourselves. That means all of your relationships are with people who continue to sin. So a necessary aspect of love, therefore, is learning to live patiently with people as they continue on their own journey of learning to live more righteously. And that's what loving well is all about, giving people the space and the time that they need as they grow. Without long-suffering love, Our holy God could never commune with each of us unholy people who are not instantly sanctified when we're born into his family. Do you understand that? If God himself was not patient and long-suffering, he would not be able to fellowship with us because you were not instantly Christ-like the moment you trusted Christ. And I wasn't either. It's necessary for his relationship with us. That makes it necessary for our relationships with each other. Living happily ever after, he writes, is not the goal. Living well with broken people is. What would that do to a church body if every church member realized the goal for me right now in Christ is to learn to live well with these broken people around me? Consider the following commands. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Paul writes, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, even as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Smith writes, there's a very important assumption underlying each of these commands. That is, assumption is this. People, including Christians, will make your life difficult. Regularly and often. If that weren't true, there would be no need for repeated instructions to bear patiently with people. The reality is that even blood-bought, Holy Spirit-filled believers... Sin. They sin often and they sin against you. Therefore, you need to bear patiently with them as God does with you. That's hard but necessary if you're going to build relationships with others the way He builds relationships with you. Bearing patiently with your friends brings them hope. They often know they're not right, (laughs) but they don't always have confidence that other people can help them when they're not. I had a conversation with somebody years ago here, was was struggling with some relationships here, and, and I said, listen, you know you're not perfect. And our people here know you're not perfect. But they need to know that you know you're not perfect. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the selfless sacrifice of Jesus. It signifies community. It reminds us of the death of Jesus and reminds us of the unity that we share as children of God. And it's also an occasion for us to consider the judgment of God. And this is where we said before, Paul says, if you eat of this bread, drink this cup unworthily, right? Then you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Are any of us worthy to take this? And this is where we start doing the mental math. Did I have my quiet time enough this week? Did I, did I keep my temper under control enough this week? Did I mess up too much this week? And, and we start looking at, well, I had a bad week or I had a bad month. Maybe I shouldn't take today. One writer said, the problem with excessive introspection is that it leads us only back to ourselves. And once there, left to ourselves, we will never find enough worthiness. Do I in myself have any right to approach this table today? None. None. But what members of our church need to hear, what we all need to hear is this. That's the truth. That's true for me, that's true for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't deserve to take this. And I don't either. You're not worthy. But, this is the important part, but Christ is. He's worthy. His body and blood, broken and shed for you, make you worthy. And by faith, he abides with you. So I mentioned earlier, when I come and take this bread and take this cup, I'm remembering what Jesus did for me, but I'm also remembering something else. It is not just the righteousness of Jesus Christ in my place that made me his child to begin with. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon me, in me, credited to me, that maintains my relationship with God every single day. When I take this, I'm acknowledging it is by grace that I'm saved. It is by his grace I stay saved. I wasn't good enough to make me right. I'm not good enough to keep me right. I needed Jesus to make me right. I need Jesus to continue to be my right standing before God. And that's what I'm declaring when I eat this bread and drink this cup.
And if you are in Christ, you are able to declare that same thing. I come to this table because Jesus said I could. So let's take that and think about that. As we approach this table today, here's what's supposed to be able to happen. You and I are supposed to be able to look around this room and, and this is something else you know. Well, this is a very private thing, so nobody watch anybody else. It's a very private thing. It's communion. Here's what ought to be able to happen. I can look around this room and I can see, hey, there's somebody in Christ just like me. There's my sister. There's my brother. There's someone that Jesus came and purchased with his precious blood. Isn't he wonderful? And isn't it wonderful that we can share this together? And isn't it wonderful that one day we are declaring that Jesus died, but one day he's going to come back and we're all going to be able to see him together. Isn't that wonderful? That's what's supposed to be able to happen when we share this together. It signifies community. So what is it that unites us? Well, it's obviously not, for, for the Corinthians, it certainly wasn't income or social status. <laughs> that, that'll, that'll divide us every time. For us, it's not where we're from. It shouldn't be income or so, it can't be income or social status. It can't be politics. It can't be any list of personal preferences that are the basis of our uniting because we're all very different and God created us so, and that's okay. But what ought to be able to unite us is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that makes us right with Him. We ought to be able to come together today as believers in Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ, you ought to be able to come together and say, you know what, we may not agree on everything, but we agree on Jesus. And as I look at you, you may make some choices I don't think I can make, but you know what, I'm trusting God to hold you up. I I think I read that somewhere, Romans 14, somewhere in there. You may make some decisions about some things a little different than I do, but but I'm trusting God to make you stand, and, and you're trusting God to make me stand, and we're coming to Him together because He made us right through His Son, Jesus Christ. We share that. And you know what, that ought to be more important than anything else if we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit inside each one of us, then we ought to be endeavoring to maintain that connection because he's produced it and ultimately he's sustaining it. This is the picture of the Lord's table. So examine yourself. Can you come and eat today?